our next speaker is uh, Ian Plymer. Uh, Professor Plymer is an Australian geologist and professor of mining at the University of Adelaide. He's, a direct, he's the director of several mining and exploration companies. Uh, he's author of many scientific papers and six books. Uh, among his books are Telling Lies for God, Reason versus Creationism. Two of his, two of his books question the existence of man-made climate change. The first one is Heaven and Earth. There's some details of the book in the table uh, next to the wall, on the table next to the wall. And the next book is How to Get Expelled from a School, a guide to climate change for pupils, parents, and punters. <laughs> Professor Plimmer will be talking about climate change activism, an attack on Western civilization. Professor Plimmer. It was a Tuesday, 4,567 million years ago, when this planet formed from recycled stardust. And ever since then, we have had change, including climate change. So if someone says, do you believe in climate change? That is the question of a moron. <laughs> because we have a very, very good history of planet Earth, and that will lead me into the question, how do we know what we know? Now, after that Tuesday, we had some 800 million years of bombardment by extraterrestrials. And these added chemicals to the Earth, they might have even added the building blocks of life to Earth. That was a period when volcanic gases condensed, pools of water formed, and then they were vaporised. And when we stopped vaporising water on Earth, we had a remarkable event. We saw life appear on Earth. And that life was primitive Earth, that life reflected the primitive earth, and that life is still with us. You carry it in your body. 90% of your cells are bacteria. 15% of your weight is bacteria. You still carry that primitive life. And that was an incredible event when we suddenly saw life on earth. And that life on earth had a profound effect on the history of the planet. In the early part of the planet, we might have had acid waters as the oceans, bubbling like a soda, but it settled down to being the normal business of the planet. And at that period of time, we had an atmosphere that contained perhaps 20% carbon dioxide, something that the EPA tells us is a pollutant. And that early Earth was changing. We know from evidence written in stone in Africa that we had an ice age. That ice age, we don't know whether it was global or not, but how on earth did we have an ice age? And there's a really simple scientific answer. We don't know. <laughs> and we went back to being the business of a normal, warm, wet greenhouse planet. And for more than 80% of time, we've never had ice on Earth. We live in rare times. But that happened again some 2,600 million years ago. We had another great ice age, and we see that in North America. And that ice age, we can see evidence that we had ice at the equator and at sea level. How the hell did that happen? We don't know. Science is certainly not settled. But what we do know is that after that ice retreated, very finely ground up rock flour particles ended up in the oceans. And these oceans had this nutrient added to the dominant life on Earth, 
and it's still the dominant life on Earth. It's bacteria. If you think you're important, you're being appallingly narcissistic. Bacteria rule the world and always have. And that bacteria thought to itself, as bacteria do, saying, wow, here I've suddenly got some nutrients. And it diverged. And it diverged into one sort of bacteria, which was really toxic, and another sort of bacteria stayed behind. Now, that toxic bacteria emitted a gas. And that gas started to increase in the atmosphere. It started to dissolve in seawater. It started to kill off rival bacteria that had a cell with all the cellular material protected by a cell wall. But that particular bacteria had a nucleus. And that was a second layer of protection. And that poisonous gas that was put into the atmosphere is called oxygen. And that is quite poisonous for some cells. And as we started to build up the oxygen in the atmosphere and dissolve in the oceans, then something really bizarre happened. The oceans rusted. And we precipitated huge amounts of iron oxide on the sea floor, which has given us the great iron ore deposits around the world. And that iron oxide is telling us that we've had bacteria, that is life, the atmosphere where the oxygen went, the oceans where the iron was dissolved and the rocks that we precipitated, that we've had life, the air, the oceans and rocks all working together. And they still do. Nothing's changed. But at that period of time, we had a surface of the earth that just flipped every now and then. But we'd built up enough material in the crust where it couldn't flip. So the surface of the Earth started to move and we started the process of plate tectonics, where we pulled apart the crust or stitched it back together again, forming big mountain chains. And that was a process which started during Middle Age in the history of the planet. And then we had an appallingly boring period of time only a billion years, where the planet again was warm, wet, greenhouse planet, plenty of volcanic activity, but we didn't have any great irreversible processes. But another extraordinary event happened some 800 million years ago. And that extraordinary event was yet again another climate change. This is when we covered the Earth with ice when we had snowball ice. We can see evidence, very good evidence, written in rocks that we had 20 kilometres of ice at sea level, at the equator. And again, the scientific question, well, how did that happen? And the answer is, well, scientists have a huge amount of argument about this, but we really don't know. But it not only happened once, it happened twice. So how can you have the Earth go from plus 40 degrees Celsius to minus 40, then back to plus 40, then back to minus 40, then again to plus 40. That's what happened. And so to explain that requires a huge amount of evidence. We don't yet have that evidence. But what we do know is that between the first and the second of these great ice ages, we had coral reefs form, or the precursor to coral reefs. And these were complicated, multicellular life. Before that, all reefs, and reefs go back to 3,500 million years ago, all reefs were composed of single-celled organisms. Reefs are not unusual. Dying of reefs, appearing of reefs is quite common. But this particular reef formed about 700 million years ago. It's called the Arcarula Reef. It appeared with complex life, and then it disappeared. It was wiped out by the next great climate change, which in fact was glaciation. It wasn't uh, warming. And then we came back into a warm period some 650 million years ago, 600 million years ago, and we'd had the melting of ice sheets. We'd had the addition of nutrients to the oceans. And the bacteria, the two sorts of bacteria, thought to themselves, wow, I'm going to take a bit of this. And they started to, to ingest nutrients, and we had a diversification of life into multicellular organisms, which are still with us, and you're one of them, 
and single-celled organisms, and 90% of your cells are those, and we had this diversification of life. We see it written in stone, and we see that was very much related to a massive climate change where we had a period of warming. That life is called the Ediacaran fauna. It appeared on a Tuesday 583 million years ago, and these were soft-bodied, multicellular organisms. And what did they do? They ate bacteria. They ate the slime that was on the ocean floor. And uh, most slime, I think, is green, and it's appropriately named. Um, and <laughs> they cleaned out the ocean floors. Before that, we had algal mats on the floor of the ocean. We don't have them any longer. We have them in some isolated places, but this Ediacaran fauna cleaned the ocean floors and then 520 million years ago it diversified again and some of them started to have skeletons, shells and a body architecture which protected them. So what happened to the Ediacarans? They were eaten and they disappeared and we then had what was called in the geological record an explosion of life. It wasn't really. It was an explosion of predation, that well-armed organisms could eat others. And that's the story of life. <clears throat> that period of predation still exists. And again, we had a warm, wet greenhouse planet until a time when we had a very short-lived period of an ice age. And immediately after that ice age, what happened? We had another explosion of life. And you get the picture now. I've mentioned three explosions of life, and each time they were after an ice age. And that was when we started to get plants on the surface of the planet. And these plants on planet Earth are still with us. This was telling us that we still had significant carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And these plants tended to add more oxygen to the atmosphere. And not being content with that, we had a mass extinction of life. Mass extinctions are quite common. We've had five major mass extinctions of multicellular life. Mostly they're due to things that come from out there, or dirty big volcanoes. We have never seen a mass extinction of life due to past global warming. We have seen extinctions due to cooling, but not due to warming. So this first great mass extinction of life we don't quite know the origin of it. And that's good. Science had never settled on anything. <clears throat> we then came out of that mass extinction. We had all these new ecologies that were created and life expanded into these new ecologies. Mass extinctions are good if you're a survivor. If you're not, well, we just get the normal species turnover. And again, we had a life of the planet going back to a warm, wet greenhouse planet until we had something with your name written on it that came from out there and it hit Sweden about 360 million years ago. And it vaporised bits of Sweden, which is probably not a bad thing, and we had massive tsunamis go right across Europe and come back, and that gave us a mass extinction of life, plus we had a huge event of volcanic activity around the world so things that rattle the planet can actually give you volcanoes. And what happened after that mass extinction? Well, we came back into life as usual. And again, we had an expansion of life, mainly plants. And after that period of time, we had a huge deposition of plant material, which has given us the coal in the Northern Hemisphere, the Carboniferous coals, and in the Southern Hemisphere in India, the Permian coals. And these coals, formed in cooler climates, not in Amazonian type conditions, because plant material breaks down very quickly. If you're going to form a coal, you need peat. Peat forms in cold climates. This is telling us we had a cool climate, and in Permian times, we had yet again another ice age. And these climate changes are quite normal. That ended, <clears throat> it ended with a bang 251.2 million years ago. And this was when we had a mass extinction of life, but the biggest mass extinction we've ever seen. 
This was when 96% of species were wiped out. Now, how did that happen? Well, we're not quite sure, but it could have been a dirty big asteroid that hit us. It could have been volcanic activity in Siberia, or it could have been both. Because if you rattle the planet enough, you will create melting and volcanic activity. And so that mass extinction, the biggest mass extinction that we've ever had on life, uh, of life on Earth, gave us, again, new ecosystems. And that's when today's modern corals appeared, after that ecosystem. I want to come back to talking about coral reefs in a bit. So <clears throat> you're getting the picture now. The planet is dynamic. Climate has always changed. Extinction is normal. And um, maybe we are quite insignificant in the, the history of the planet. After that period of time, <clears throat> we again went back into warm, wet greenhouse times. And again, another mass extinction about 217 million years ago. And that's probably due to, again, asteroids hitting us. And again, that um, rattled the Earth a lot, so much so that we opened up the Atlantic Ocean and separated uh, the Americas from um, Africa and Europe. These are major processes. And once you start pulling apart the crust, which is what's been happening in the last 2,500 million years, we have leakage of gas from deep in the Earth. And that leakage of gas is really interesting. We can measure it. What leaks out? Well, the most abundant greenhouse gas on planet Earth leaks out, and that is water vapour. We have a leaking out of carbon dioxide. We have a leaking out of methane and small amounts of um, rotten egg gas and sulphur gases and argon and other gases. So our planet is constantly leaking gas. Our atmosphere used to be full of carbon dioxide. Why isn't it now? Well, what's happened? is we've sequestered this from the atmosphere, and quite naturally. And we sequester it into limey rocks. And you can do the experiment. If you've got a limey rock dolomite, to take carbon dioxide from air and to make dolomite, you need about 15% carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. To form limestone, you need less carbon dioxide. So we go back in the geological record, and we look where the dolomites occur. Well, dolomite occurs between 2,500 million years ago and 500 million years ago. This is telling us that the Earth's atmosphere was incredibly rich in carbon dioxide. And that's exactly the time when we had a booming of life on Earth, when we had the explosion of life. So to argue that a high atmospheric carbon dioxide kills off life is contrary to evidence. And this story that I'm giving you is tied to evidence, which is reproducible and can be validated. So we come back. We were at last at 217 million years ago. Ocean, uh, the Atlantic Ocean opened up. And then we continued to move our continents. And we continued to have climate change. And there was a slight glaciation event about 150 million years ago. That event was mainly polar. We see good evidence for that. After that, we had again an explosion of plant life. And this is when we had the great southern continent, Gondwana, was at the South Pole. And we can see polar sequences in India, South America, Argentina, Australia, um, Southern Africa. We see that we must have been covered in ice. <coughs> And what happened to that continent? Well, that continent shifted from being polar, and even though it was at the pole and cold, it then shifted into temperate and tropical conditions. That was a climate change. And we see evidence of rocks from the ancient magnetic field which uh, tell us that we had tropical conditions. So we can measure magnetism in rocks. Any rocks that form at the equator have a magnetic field like this. As you go north from here, the magnetic field goes steeper and steeper and steeper, and at the pole, it's vertical. So if, when we measure these great Ice Age events of 800 million years ago, if we measure the magnetic field, it's like that. So it had to form at the equator. And it's not that you have one measurement, you have thousands of them. If we measure the rocks 
in which we have broad-leafed tropical fossils, the magnetic field is vertical. And they're, they're the rocks now that we find in India. So the continents must have moved and carried their burden with them. So 100 million years ago, we had a great geological event that took place. We started to break up this supercontinent and we shifted India, Australia, northwards. India decided to leave Australia and drift across the Indian Ocean. Australia got rid of New Zealand, which is a pretty good thing, and <laughs> push, pushed them out into the ocean and gave them their well-deserved volcanoes and earthquakes. And we had a period of time where the continents were moving quite quickly. We had a minor mass extinction at 90 million years ago, but the mass extinction you know about is at 65 million years ago. And everyone knows, everyone knows that there was a dirty big asteroid that was heading for Texas. It missed, it hit Mexico, <laughs> and vaporised bits of Mexico. Um, and on that asteroid was written dead dinosaur and it wiped out the dinosaurs, there's no vegetation for them to eat and they are coughing in these sulfurous fumes. That's the story, we all know it. But it may be wrong. And that's the basis of science. We do not really know everything and scientific theories are always changing. The alternative theory is that we had massive volcanic activity in India, the Deccan Traps. That put out so much sulphur gases into the atmosphere, vegetation died, organisms coughed themselves to death, and we had a mass extinction. So for every great scientific theory, there are competing theories. There's no such thing as a consensus in science. After that mass extinction event, we started to cool down about 50 million years ago. And that cooling was um, partly due to where the continents are, it was partly due to solar activity, but we have had 50 million years of cooling. This was exacerbated about 34 million years ago when South America had the good sense to pull away from Antarctica. And we left Antarctica as the polar continent and we set up a circumpolar current that isolated Antarctica from warm waters and from 34 million years ago, Antarctica froze and it is still frozen. And the rocks in Antarctica, we can join up with those in South America, those in Australia, those in Africa, those in India. Antarctica um, is now covered in ice. But where does that ice lie? Well, that ice sits in the highlands. We can drill through it, we can measure gravity, we can measure all sorts of physical properties of the ice. And the ice actually sits in basins in, Antarct in Antarctica. Now if the air temperature warms, you're not going to melt the ice in the basin. What happens if that ice flows uphill out of the basins and then moves down glaciers? No global warming is going to make ice move uphill. It moves uphill because of pressure of ice on top of it. So just because the ice is moving in Antarctica doesn't mean we've got global warming. It's probably due to a very common phenomenon known as rheology. So Antarctica developed ice. We started to become quite warm in short periods of warmth during this long period of cooling. And we kept cooling and we kept cooling and we kept cooling until about six million years ago. And six million years ago, we hominids who appeared on Earth about 34 million years ago, we hominids were faced with a problem. And the problem was that our forests had gone to grasslands. And we had a choice. We could choose to become extinct or we could adapt. And we did adapt. We see in the fossils that there is a hip structure that has enabled hominids to be biped. We see in the fossils um, footprints, and we can work out the size and the weight of these primitive hominids from the footprints. And so what was that driven by? That was driven by climate, and it was driven by cooling. And the great changes on planet Earth have been driven by cooling, not by warming. Warming, good for you. And we kept cooling, but from about six million years ago, because we'd had this long cooling cycle, 
then very, very slight cycles that we see on Earth started to influence the climate. Now, the climate in the past has been driven by a number of features. Every 143 million years, we have a bad address, and that is a galactic address, and we get bombarded by particles, clouds form, reflect light and heat, we get precipitation, and we get a cooling event. <coughs> we also have the Earth's orbit that wobbles. And it wobbles every 100,000 years when we get a little bit further away from the sun or a bit closer to the sun. It wobbles every 41,000 years and it wobbles every 23,000 years. And these wobbles give us cycles of climate. We hear that the sun is a stable star. It isn't. It has just very slight variations in the energy it gives out. And so we have solar cycles every couple of thousand years, every 210 years, every 87 years, every 22 years. These cycles, <coughs> which we can measure and we can observe them and we can work out when they occurred in the past from the chemicals that these cycles left behind in, in sediments and now rocks, we see that the planet has got cycles. It's got cycles in the ocean. It's got cycles in the lunar tides. So when we look at climate, climate is very cyclical and when two cycles overlap, we get things happening quickly and I'll go through that in a second. So, six million years ago, those 41,000 year cycles started to appear. Later, they changed to 100,000 year cycles. We don't know why. But these orbital cycles put us close to the sun or further away from the sun. Currently, we are in a cycle that has got us a little bit close to the sun. It will end. It will end uh, soon. And we'll go back to the orbital cycle for 90,000 years when we're a little bit further from the sun. <clears throat> About two and a half million years ago, another extraordinary event took place. We glued North America to South America with volcanic activity in Panama. And what that changed was the circulation of water between the Atlantic and the Pacific. And what that meant was that the heat balance of the surface of the Earth was changed. Don't think about global warming and the atmosphere. The atmosphere doesn't hold much heat. It's the oceans that hold the heat. And we changed the heat balance, we suddenly cooled, and that was quite coincidental with a supernova eruption that bombarded us with particles, and we've still got evidence of those. They form new elements and we find them in sediments. And so we had two events that gave us cooling, and suddenly <coughs> we hominids were really stressed. <coughs> and what did we do? Well, some of us became extinct, and some of us evolved into our species, into Homo, which is you. And how do you survive? You survive by being a hunter. What is fundamental for hunting besides tools? It's communication. So we find in these early Homo fossils, they have the Broca's area in the brain developed, and that is the area for speech. And we find in the fossils, the larynx is developed such that they could talk. Now, they, these hominids, probably only had a vocabulary of 50 or 100 words, and there are many people in politics that have got that, <laughs> and, uh, but they could communicate. And that's what you need for hunting. And we know they were efficient hunters because they had fire, and if you cook meat, <coughs> it metabolises better than uncooked meat. And we know that they were efficient because they had excess food, because people of my age, and you can see in the fossils that had, had broken bones, they had been thrown a bone and they had been fed, so they must have been efficient. And that process was driven by cooling. And then we went into the 100,000 year cycles of 90,000 years of cold, 10,000 of warm, 90,000 of cold, 10,000 of warm. And what did sea level do? Well, sea level was up and down like a yo-yo. And sea level would rise 130 metres in a warm period, it would drop about the same in a cold period. Sea level changes are quite normal. And <clears throat> We come to the last warmer period, the interglacial, between 128,000 years ago and 116,000 years ago. And at that period of time, it was warm. Sea level was about seven metres higher. Uh, there were four species of hominids on planet Earth. You, Homo sapiens, although the sapiens bit's always a bit doubtful. Um, <coughs> Homo neanderthalensis and neanderthals, the um, uh, flores uh, species from Indonesia and... Uh, homo erectus, upright human. Four of us, 
coexisted. And then we started to cool. And we started to cool, driven by the orbit. We got a little bit further away from the sun 116,000 years ago. And that cooling cycle was exacerbated by a supervolcano. And that was a supervolcano of Tobar 74,000 years ago. And that put so much dust into the atmosphere that um, we had cooling. Now, volcanoes can have a profound effect on climate. One volcano can ruin your whole day. Now, we give you a few examples. Just south of here, Mount St Helens, that put out one cubic kilometre of aerosols into the atmosphere. Krakatoa in 745 and in 1883 put out about 30 cubic kilometres of aerosols into the atmosphere. But a supervolcano, as we have in... Yellowstone National Park, as we have in Tambora in Indonesia, as we have in Taupo in New Zealand, they will put out only 10,000 cubic kilometres into the atmosphere. Tobar, we think, 74,000 years ago, put out about 3,000 cubic kilometres into the atmosphere. That was tropical, so this dust went worldwide, and we see it in the geological record. We reflected light, we reflected heat, we added all these sulphur compounds to the atmosphere and we had extinction. We had extinction of tropical species. We started to have stressed humans. You as Homo sapiens, the geneticists tell us, went down to about 8,000 people. We very nearly became extinct. And that was a crisis. It was a cold period of time. There was migration of people from the tropics into the cooler areas. Uh, that's probably when we got the, the first migratory um, influx of people into Australia 70,000 years ago, and we've just had some information two weeks ago saying that we've got some data confirming that. But it was cooling, and it was cooling, and it was cooling. Here, you would have been covered in ice. Much of North America was covered in kilometre-thick sheets of ice. Scandinavia was covered in a couple of kilometres of ice, as was most of Europe, down to the Alps. In the Southern Hemisphere, we covered <coughs> parts, the southern part of the continents. We had very, very cold periods, the zenith of which was about 20,000 years ago. It was cold. Now, what happens if you load up a landmass with a couple of kilometres of ice? Well, we know that. We've measured it in Scandinavia. We put five kilometres of ice in Scandinavia, and it sinks. That ice is now gone. What's Scandinavia doing? It's rising. Now, how does that affect sea level measurements? Well, it totally stuffs them up. Um, so if someone talks to you about sea level change, the first question you say is, what's the land level doing? And I'll come back to that in a second. So we can load continents with ice and take it off. And 20,000 years ago, it was cold here. It was very, very cold. And you were covered in ice. Other parts of the world, such as in Australia, we didn't have ice covering the bulk of the continent, same in Mongolia, but what we had were very, very strong winds, very cold winds, and these winds were shifting sand dunes around. We had massive devegetation. 20,000 years ago, the Amazon was a grassland with copses of trees. That's quite normal to have changes like that. And about 14,000 years ago, we started to see the first glimmer of an interglacial and it started to warm up. And at periods where you go from cold to warm or warm to cold, you get extreme weather. You get sudden changes. And so we had sudden periods of warming, sudden periods of cooling, and uh, these periods of warming were not like the global warming today that people are having conniptions about, where they're worried about a 0.7 degrees Celsius temperature rise. <laughs> These were only 12 or 14 degrees Celsius temperature changes, and very, very quick. And at 12,000 years ago, the ice sheet started to melt. Where did the water go? Into the oceans. What's happened is sea level has risen in the last 12,000 years. It's only risen 130 metres. And it is still rising because we're still melting ice sheets. This is part of a long-term process. And then we dropped into a massive cold period about 11,000 years ago. This was called the Younger Dryas. And in this massive cold period, the temperature drop was about 15 to 20 degrees Celsius. 
It was severe. And we hominids huddled in little groups. And there it dawned on us to invent animal husbandry and to invent agriculture. And we started to grow crops. And we started to, to have uh, animals such as sheep and goats and cattle. That started, again, driven by global cooling. Then it started to warm again. Then it cooled again about 8,500 years ago. Then it warmed again. And the warmest period in our current interglacial was about four to 6,000 years ago. Temperatures were about five degrees higher than now. Sea level was about two metres higher. And it was a wonderful time, the second best time to be on planet Earth. Today is the best time. And then it cooled again. Then it warmed. So in Minoan times, it was warm. And then it cooled again. Uh, and then it warmed in uh, Egyptian times. And it cooled again. Then it warmed again in uh, Greek and Roman times. And you get the picture. Every time it's warm, you have thriving economies and you have big empires. Every time it's cool, things change. Now, we've got a really good record from Roman times till now. The Romans were very good record keepers. And we know of their salt harvests. We know of their grape growing. They grew grapes in northern England. These were wine grapes. Now, you couldn't do it now. The English tried to make wine, but it's pretty dreadful. You wouldn't even give it to your dog. Um, but uh, we know from Roman records of where the olives were grown. Olives were grown as far north as Bonn in the Rhine Valley. Um, we know it was much warmer. Now, the Romans were scantily clad. It might have been due to warm weather, or it might have been that they were going to an orgy. I like the second <laughs> explanation best. But <clears throat> it was warm, and we have good records of it. And we also have good records of sea level because we have old Roman ports. And what has happened? Some of these Roman ports are now covered in water. Other Roman ports, like Ephesus in Turkey, are 15 kilometres inland and seven metres above sea level. That's telling us that the land level is going up and down. So again, if someone tells you about sea level change, you've got to think about land level changes also. And <clears throat> In Roman times, it came to a sudden end. It came to a sudden end um, with a massive climate change. Now, it was those times, in Roman times and in Greek times, where we had the first seeds sown for Western civilization. The Greeks, in effect, invented logic, something I come back to. They invented science. And the Romans wrote down law to give us Justinian law. The Romans started to record things, which is the basis of Western civilization. And about 545 AD, we had a couple of coincidental events, a couple of massive volcanoes, Papua New Guinea, Indonesia, and the sun started to become a bit lazy. And it had fewer sunspots, it emitted less energy, and we dropped into a cold period. And that cold period is called the Dark Ages. And it's called the Dark Ages because it was bloody well dark. It was very hard to see and it was dark politically and dark socially. This was a terrible period of time to live in. It was cold, your crops failed, you were weakened, you succumbed to the plague, uh, warfare increased. Cool times are the times not to live in. It's the warm times that are good. And what happened about 900 AD was all of a sudden it started to warm up again. Well, it's related to that great ball of sky, a great ball in the sky called the sun. Uh, for some odd reason, the sun does have a major part in driving climate. And solar activity changed. We started to warm up. And we had a warm period between 900 and 1300 AD. That was called the medieval warming. And we know that because the Vikings have recorded that they grew barley and wheat in Greenland. They had cattle in Greenland. You couldn't grow crops in Greenland today. The Vikings dug graves. They didn't have any permafrost. It was warm. The Vikings got adventuresome and went in their boats long distances fishing. They actually colonised Newfoundland. The Vikings, they called it Vinland. They grew grapes there. Uh, the, the Vikings were the first to feel that medieval warming. 
that medieval warming, it was so warm, about four or five degrees warmer than now, that you could be very safe to have two harvests every year. It was a fabulous period to be alive. There was plenty of food, no disease, populations increased enormously, economies grew, and the excess money in Europe went into building the great monasteries and universities and cathedrals. That was due to global warming. And that all came to an end very quickly. And between 1280 and 1303, we went from the medieval warming into the Little Ice Age. That climate change took 23 years. And in 1303, the Gulf of Bosnia, that area between Finland and Sweden, was frozen. And again in 1305, 1306, it got cold. It got cold very quickly, and it was driven by a lazy sun, a sun that was not emitting as much energy. And we know that from the lack of sunspots, and we know that from the chemicals left in sediments and soils and rocks from the radiation coming from the sun. And during that little ice age, we had some exceptionally cold periods, um, one of which I want to talk about in a second, but this was when we had death, we had starvation, we had crop failure, and the weakened population of Europe got hit by the plague in 1349. Don't give me cold times, they depopulate. And the population of 1280 took 250 years to recover back to that level during the Little Ice Age. And our story now with human-induced climate change starts in the Maunder Minimum about 300 years ago. This was when the sun was a bit lazy. It was bitterly cold. This is when you could barbecue oxen on the Thames River. This is when the great Dutch masters painted the hoarfrosts and painted the exceptionally cold periods of time. For the last 300 years, we have been warming up. We have been warming up since the Maunder Minimum in the Little Ice Age. A key question, which part of that warming is natural and which part is due to human living on planet Earth? But we started to measure temperatures with thermometers in Middle England about then. They're not that reliable, but we started to measure temperatures more reliably from about 1850. And we had a warming period from 1850 to 1890. Then we had a cooling period. Then we had a, um, a warming period up until about 1940. Then we had a cooling period to the mid-70s. Then we had a warming period uh, to about uh, the late 1990s. And then we haven't had a temperature rise or fall since then. So the key questions one has to ask then is, if we're in a period of global warming, how come we've had periods of cooling? And how come we've had periods of no temperature change? So. As a scientist, my opinions are married to evidence. That evidence will change. And accordingly, I will change my opinion. Science is not dogmatic. There is no consensus. Science is anarchistic. You do not believe any authority. In fact, the word believe is used in politics and religion. It's not used in science. Hence the morons question, which I raised before. Science is married to evidence which must be validated, it must be reproducible, and it must be in accord with previous validated evidence. This is my principal criticism of the current global warming fraudulent fad, and that is that it's not in accord with the historical and the geological evidence, where we've had many periods of warming and cooling, but unrelated to humans. So the absolute take-home key question that I want to pose today is a simple one. Can you please show me that it is the human emissions of carbon dioxide that drive global warming? Now, that question has never been answered, and it's always avoided by those who want to scare us witless about how we're going to fry and die. Can you please show me that the human emissions drive global warming? Now, the game's already over because only 3% of global emissions come from humans. The other 97% is natural, degassing from the oceans and volcanoes, and I'm breathing in air at 0.04% CO2, I'm breathing out 4%. Uh, we, we have a lot of changes going on. So if you can show me, which has never been done, that the 3% of emissions drive global warming, 
you also have to show me that the 97% of natural emissions do not. And that's not been done. Never been done. So what's the end result of this? The end result of this is we've had a green movement want to give us renewable energy on the basis that it reduces our carbon dioxide emissions. So it's based on a fallacy to start with. I don't call it renewable energy. I call it ruinable energy because it ruins economies. Uh, with wind industrial complexes, I don't call them farms because farms are actually productive. Um, with wind industrial complexes, the amount of energy that you need to make the steel pylons, to make the concrete, to make the magnets, to make the wiring, the amount of energy is more than that wind complex will ever produce. That's why they're subsidised. The second thing is, you need a standing reserve. You need a generator somewhere, coal, gas or nuclear, hydro, ticking away for when the wind doesn't blow. Uh, the third thing is that um, the amount of carbon dioxide that is saved is actually zero, or it's actually worse than that, because you've got to keep a generator ticking away to make the concrete, to make the steel, to make the copper, the rare earth elements and all the infrastructure, you have to put out huge amounts of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Now, I don't care about that because carbon dioxide is plant food. It's wonderful stuff. And we are getting fairly low in the atmosphere in carbon dioxide. So to put up these unsightly wind turbines, which slice and dice birds and bats, um, that cannot be an environmental matter. You cannot claim as an environmentalist, oh, isn't that beautiful, I've destroyed the view, I'm killing all the wildlife, oh, by the way, the gearbox is leaking toxins, and to produce the blades, then I can't dispose of the blades because I release toxins. You cannot, as an environmentalist, take that view. It's absolutely out of order. And the same for solar power. Solar power, like wind power, provides intermittent power, which is why it has to be subsidised, uh, to make solar panels, the same arguments apply about the amount of energy you put into it, the amount of carbon dioxide you release. This is a negative gain system. Who funds these wind complexes? Well, it's the poor people. I can afford to pay an increased electricity bill, um, but that electricity I get is subsidised. Who subsidises it? The people who really can't afford to subsidise it. So this is an environmental attack on poor people and it continues to get worse. So we now have, in Western wealthy countries, people suffering from fuel poverty, people who do not have enough money to pay their electricity bills. Last year in Germany, 6.2 million people were served notice that they're going to have their power cut off because they couldn't pay their bill. 330,000 households were cut off from power. Um, we have a very wealthy country like Germany where at the bottom of the social stratum we have people who cannot pay for a basic commodity called electricity in today's modern world. Now that is the end result of environmentalism. It is to impoverish people and it's to have subsidised inefficient energy. You cannot have an electricity system run by <coughs> ideological greens when in fact power engineers might be better people to run it. And that's where we've got to. But our environmental movement says, well, look, um, we have the science to support it. My argument is, no, what you are capitalising on is three decades of dumbing down of the education system. We now have people, when they talk about carbon pollution, I say, oh, wait a minute, um, carbon's black. If we had carbon pollution, you wouldn't be able to see anything. Um, the other form of carbon is diamond, and the whole sky would sparkle and be diamonds everywhere. Of course, they'd be worth nothing because they'd be so abundant. So what are you really talking about? And eventually they might say, oh, carbon dioxide. You say, well, look, let's just establish we're talking about the same thing. What is the molecular weight of carbon dioxide? 99% of them can't give you the answer, which is 44. They, ca they can't give it to you. So what we're having is a dumbed-down system where people now are working on ideology and they're telling us that we're going to fry and die. And the key question, philosophical question, we have to ask in science is how do we know what we know? And this is based on validated, repeatable evidence. 
and you repeat and you repeat and you repeat and repeat, but you get one piece of evidence that goes against your theory, you have to reject the theory. That's not what, what is happening. So what is happening is people have models. Now, models are not data. Models are an attempt to try to understand a complex system. We have over 110 models created in the last two and a half decades of where temperature is going to be today, and they're wrong. And it's not that one or two of them are wrong, they're wrong. All of them are wrong. Now, it's very, very hard to be wrong on everything. So what we've got is a comparison between models and the comparison between what we measure. And they're wrong. So as soon as someone says, oh, we're going to fry and die, say, well, is that from a model or is that from a measurement? And they say, oh, well, you know, we're going to have to have snorkels here. We're only a few metres above sea level here. Oh, wait a minute. Sea level rises and falls, land level rises and falls, you load up the land with sediment, you load up the land with ice, it'll sink. And if something sinks, someone else will rise. So what's happened is we've loaded up Scandinavia with ice, it's sunk, the Netherlands rose, the ice has gone off, the Netherlands is sinking. Great case for an international court case, but uh, we'll see how we go. Um, so sea level rises due to temperature of the water, the volume of the water, whether you put a big mass of rock on the floor of the ocean, such as a large igneous volcanic province, whether in fact the ocean floor sinks, uh, whether you've got wind pushing water to the other side of the ocean or not, whether you've got a mountain range next to the ocean. So, for example, the Andes, sea level is higher on the Andean coast than it is in the centre of the Pacific, which is about 30 metres lower than uh, sea level than the Andes. It depends upon where El Nino is in its cycles. Sea level uh, is not just related to climate, it's related to many things. I've mentioned about reefs. We've had reefs on planet Earth for 3,500 million years, we'll still have them. Reefs come, reefs go. And why do reefs die? It's not due to warm water. Reefs love warm water. In fact, most of the world's coral reefs are in tropical areas. We do have a few colder climate corals, but coral is incredibly resilient. It's been with us for hundreds of millions of years. It has suffered all sorts of climate changes and is still with us. The reason why coral dies is it gets exposed to the air. And that is if the land level rises or if the water drops or is pulled away. Coral is a very, very resilient um, organism. Well, we hear about Antarctica, how Antarctic ice is melting. Well, of course it's melting in some places because sea level has risen 130 metres and now the West Antarctic ice sheet is underpinned by a few islands and sits on water. Uh, once sea level falls again, that ice is stable. Antarctic ice actually sits on 23 volcanoes. These are giving out huge amounts of heat. That's melting ice. Ice is flowing uphill out of the basin due to more ice accumulating, then dropping down glaciers into the ocean. In fact, the Antarctic ice sheet is increasing. Sea surface temperatures are decreasing. It's getting colder. In the Arctic, the Greenland ice mass has been increasing since 2015. Sea surface temperatures have been going down. So maybe we're not going into a period of cooling, uh, of warming. We might be going into a period of cooling. And we hear all this codswallop about, oh, this is the hottest year ever. Simple questions. When did you start measuring it? How did you measure it? Who measured it? And the most important thing is a very, very large number of surface measurements today are adjusted. And, and so we have a measurement and it is adjusted and invariably the adjustment is upwards on the more recent measurements and on the older measurements it's downwards and that's showing a warming trend. This is primary data that people are changing. That is called fraud. And a lot of the temperature measurements and carbon dioxide measurements are underpinned by fraud. Um, we hear about the hottest year ever. Well, in this interglacial, We've had 9,900 years hotter than the, the hottest years in the 90s and the 20s. So when do you start the measurements? What does it all mean? We hear that we live in a period of extinction. We don't. We live in a period of normal species turnover. A mass extinction is where you get 75% or more of species wiped out. We're nowhere near that. What is in fact happening is because of a lot of activity, mainly human activity, is we're actually increasing the number of species on planet Earth. We hear this story about the oceans are becoming acid. 
Well, excuse me, we've had oceans for thousands of millions of years. We've had oceans at periods of time when we've had much higher carbon dioxide in the atmosphere than now. And what you never hear is about the buffering of the oceans. Ocean, seawater is a chemical. It is internally buffered to stop it um, going into acid conditions. It's controlled by calcium and many other things. Seawater also circulates through the rocks beneath it, which give you another buffer. Seawater has been alkaline since the beginning of time. If you're worried about it being acid, uh, you'll have to stop all the volcanic activity on the Earth, stop all the ocean currents, and stop all the rainwater flowing into seawater. Don't wait up. Um, we hear that there's a consensus of scientists, 97%, who argue that humans change climate. Go back to the original data. That was a survey done of interested parties, and only 77 of the 3,000 respondents were chosen, and that is based on a survey of 77 people who've got a self-interest. No wonder 97% of them uh, agree. So my argument is that the global warming mantra that we are hearing today is incommensurate with history, it's incommensurate with geology, it's incommensurate with uh, the basics of science, which are underpinned by evidence and underpinned by reproducibility. And therefore, we're dealing with another phenomenon. When we hear about global warming, we are not hearing about science. This is a political method of controlling. It's a mechanism of controlling the costs of power. It's a mechanism of having control outside our elected representatives, sitting in the IPCC, sitting in organisations for which uh, we pay but have no say. Uh, it is the new religion, it is a new environmental religion where um, it is a totalitarian religion and people like me get pilloried uh, simply because I've gone across the mainstream. Now, this is very little different to what happened 500 years ago, sorry, 499 years and nine months ago with, with Martin Luther, that he was objecting to indulgences and what we are doing in this new religion is we are paying an indulgence controlled by people outside our electorate. We are paying indulgences for this wonderful, mythical, clean, green energy when in fact it's environmentally damaging, when in fact it cleans out people's pockets, when in fact it hits people, the poor people, very hard. And I would argue that Western science is based on logic that logic has been around for two and a half thousand years. This is probably the biggest scientific scam that there ever has been, and we are paying for it dearly, and we will be paying for it even more dearly because it will take 30 years to shake off. We have an army of politicians, environmental activists, banks, educators, who have made their careers on frightening us witless. That is not going to change until they die. So, I argue that the global warming mantra is attacking what we see as absolutely fundamental to existing in the West, and that is using logic, uh, using elected representatives, which we can throw out, which you can't do with the IPCC, and um, funding organisations that may well be making our life better. Uh, the global warming mantra is not making our life better. So thank you for attending. if you want to have any reliability at all, right? I live in a part of Australia where we have constant blackouts, but the government proudly announces we have 42% ruinable energy. Uh, just a quick question for you. I was in uh, Maui earlier this year, 
And all they could tell us the whole time we were there was that the coral reefs are dying because they're being bleached because the water's too warm. So hearing what you said, uh, I just want to try to understand better what you're saying. Uh, the answer is yes and no, because um, the polyps in co coral can get killed, killed by exposure um, if the water level drops and they're exposed to light and heat in the middle of the day. Coral is a warm water species. Um, our Great Barrier Reef has temperatures of about 27 degrees Celsius. Further north, Indonesia, Thailand, it's about 29 degrees. Coral loves warm water. There are many, many reasons for bleaching and for attacks on coral reef. We see it in the fossil record. It is claimed that it, it has happened just recently. Go back to the literature. There's some good science written on this in the 1930s. So it is more complicated than just warming. <coughs> coral loves warm water. It may well be a disease, and you'll find in these corals that quite often you'll kill one polyp, and later another polyp will come in and replace it. Uh, Ian, as a fellow geologist, I found your talk fascinating. Uh, with your idea that the, the planet may be cooling today, I might submit that that is good because with 7.5 billion people on the planet and growing exponentially, maybe we need a cold climate. Comment? Uh, first comment is I, I get your missives, which I enjoy. Um, the second thing is, um, we are probably uh, in a solar cycle which is going to give us a period of cooling. Now, if that period of cooling is like the more than the minimum, this is going to be seriously bad. If it's like the next glaciation, we will depopulate the planet. Uh, in North America, where there was ice, you'll be the first to go, mind you, going before you, uh, will be the Middle East, because you export so much grain to the Middle East. Uh, it will be a massive depopulation, as has happened in the past, together with warfare for resources, especially water, and uh, together with disease. Um, I don't worry about human population, because we get wiped out with great regularity. So while you've got it, enjoy it. <laughs> uh, I've heard this saying, a co common saying is the earth is an iron ball circling the sun and you mentioned the rusting of the ocean and the deposit of, of iron. Is that all surface level? Is there not iron throughout the uh, center of the earth? Uh, that's a good question. There's iron in the core of the earth, there's metallic iron. In the mantle of the earth, the silicates on the surface as silicates and then it rusts to oxides. So we've got iron in different forms. We are one of the rocky planets. Iron is a very abundant element on planet Earth and it continually gets redistributed. You've got iron in your body, which is why your blood is the colour it is. Um, we need iron in nutrition. Uh, iron is everywhere on this planet. But some of the planets, such as the icy planets, don't have nearly as much iron. Uh, <coughs> 